Text and Context. Text and Context with Dr. Travis Weeks. Miss Rachel. Yes, my child. You know what Jacko was trying to tell you? You drink sweet enough, Bridget? Yes, Miss Rachel. He asked me to marry him. You tell him yes? Well, I see things and I let it take its course. I tell him yes. Girl, I don't understand you. He come by me at late in the morning, like he couldn't hold back any longer, and he begged me. You gonna stop him? Me? After I not mad, child. The two of them have the same father and they stubborn like him, through good and through bad. It's the two of you decide. Nobody go and say nothing. I thought you would be glad. You know me a long time, Miss Rachel. When you going to tell Samson? Jacques will let him know. You have a right to make him know yourself. And why is that? There's nothing between us, Miss Rachel. Nothing? Three months back, he was carrying stuff for you and the whole village. See that? And now this? Sonny is your son too. You acting like you don't know him. Enough to see how hard it's going to hit him. Well, I don't break my promises and I can swear to that. Well, it's you, but it don't smell good to me. Why are you set against Jaco? Set against him? He is my son. But it's not him you want me to marry, eh? Answer me this, Bridget. You love him? Yes. I'm not talking about Sonny. I don't know who you're talking about. How do you mean love? He offered to put a ring on my finger when the other one didn't even mention that. No. He quiet and kind to me. Jaco will settle down and raise him family. And your grandchildren will know where their father is all the time. What more you want? I'm not ready to raise no man wild oats, Miss Rachel. You take Jacko to your bed yet? Hmm. You is a mother, but it's none of your damn business. Excuse me, child. I'm not a young girl anymore, Rachel. It's time for me to close the door on my own house, even if it's a one bedroom in your husband's yard. Hmm. I see how the world sick and use women and throw them back in the cane piece. Look, Lali. Don't talk about Lali. She is my friend, madam, granddaughter. And she don't do anything worse than the rest of you. So that is what I must content myself with. Lali is my friend too. But hmm. that is not the way I chose. Lali will say yes to any man that young and strong and ask her. Black or white. The field worker or the man passing and stop by the bank side. But... But, I born poor and black, and my pride is the only thing that I have. And that is what Jacko see, even though him quiet and soft talking. And if the owner of this estate will come now and say, lie down girl, you have nothing to lose. It's the same thing I will tell him like I tell all the others. I have nothing, but I have my pride. Black people used to work the land for nothing. And they used to treat them like beasts. Could have mount them anytime. I'm not breeding for no man just because of pleasure. I is not an animal. I is a human being.
Good day, viewers. Welcome to Text and Context. I am Dr. Travis Weeks, your presenter and moderator. And um, we just saw a very interesting scene. Um, and this scene was taken from the play An Echo in the Moon, written by deceased playwright um, Dennis Scott. And this play is actually being studied by the literature class of the Sir Atlas Community College. And so we have a panel with us consisting of the lecturer, uh, Ms. Gloria Severe, the lecturer of literature at the South Atlas Community College. And we have two other students from that class. We have with us Ms. Karima Lewis, student of literature, and Dara Sidwan, who played Rachel in the scene that you just saw, but is also part of our channel, also a literature student. And we are very keen and interested and intelligent in-house audience made up of the literature class um, who studied Echo in the Boon and will be sitting the CAPE exam this coming May. So we are going to um, all focus on that plea. And I think it's fitting if we start by getting the context of the scene that we just saw, um, the story of an Echo in the Boon. And um, I'm going to ask Karima, Karima Lewis, to assist us with that. Yes. So it would be fitting to know the context of the play before the context of the actual scene. An Echo in the Bone is a modern drama which focuses on the themes of racism, oppression, issues of identity, ownership, and of course, as you saw, women in society. So the main conflict in this play deals with the man, a man named Crew and a plantation owner, Mas Charlie. They have opposing views and this leads to detrimental consequences as in they both end up dead. The scene you both saw or you all saw a while ago, it deals with Crew's wife, Rachel, and his soon to be daughter in law, Bridget. Both Crew and Rachel have two sons, Jaco and Sonson. Sonson seems to be predisposed to his father's conditions as in his, his, he seems to deal with issues in acting in a violent manner and acting out, whereas Jacko seems to reason things out. So basically what you saw a while ago was Bridget having or taking up that choice and choosing what she wants as a woman, which doesn't normally happen in Caribbean society, in the past society. So she takes up the liberty of making a choice of choosing who she wants to be with, not just for herself as a person, but for her children, as in she's thinking of a future West Indian society. So by doing that, Bridget thinks of what is to come, what has gone and what is to come. So by putting the violence behind us, we are looking towards a future of reasoning and something that we can build on. All right, thank you very much. That was really good. Um, maybe I should throw it out to the audience, you know, um, this next question on Bridget. Um, I like what you said, Karima, about Bridget making a choice, um, which you thought was perhaps different from the Caribbean one of the past. Um, she's very decisive in terms of what she wants. Um, what, how do you feel about Bridget? I mean, can you identify with her? Consider Bridget in the context of the, the contemporary Caribbean society. As a young woman in contemporary Caribbean society, how do you relate to Bridget? Can you do so? Uh, members of the audience, would one of you want to... Um, yes, at the back here. Yeah. Can you pass it the microphone? Please stand. In my opinion, I could identify with Bridget because by through what I've learned, I've realized that black people tend to be stereotyped as vulgar, as violent, as short-tempered. But through Bridget, Scott points out to us that we can have a different outcome. We can move away from the stereotype of violence and you know, not thinking, and we can move towards a better and a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good. Um, now, Rachel is Bridget's mother-in-law. Rachel is the mother of Sonson and Jaku, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, Rachel seemed to have favored um, Sonson, at least, you know, for uh, um, Bridget, as we, as we saw in the scene. Um, why is this so? Why? 
Well, based on the context of the scene, Rachel was more trying to understand why it is she decided to make the switch from Sonson to Jacko because they're brothers and that itself can cause conflict in the household. So to go from the elder brother to the younger brother and she's pregnant, remembering that Rachel is, not Rachel, Bridget is pregnant, it will just cause collision in the household, especially since Son Son is said to be the more aggressive, volatile type, act on impulse. And Jacko is the more calmer. He takes time to take in the situation and understand what's going on. She just wants to understand why it is Bridget would just make that sudden change, knowing well that she was in a relationship with Son Son not too long ago. And that relationship itself has not come to an end. Right. The character Richard is a very interesting character. Um, there's something in, in about how Scott created that character, a particular predicament that he has put her in um, that is very significant in the play. Um, and that is her relationship with the, with the master, with Mass Charlie. Um, can, you, can you speak to that? Um, I'm curious as to um, how we examine a character like Rachel within the contemporary Caribbean society. Um, Rachel seemed to have been forced um, to give in to sexual relations with the, with the planter um, for the, her survival and the survival of her family. Um, but we don't, we're no longer in the era of plantocracy. Mm. Do Rachel still exist? Do, does the Caribbean woman still find herself in that kind of situation? Definitely. If you're talking in the context of rape, Caribbean women do face that on a daily basis, and it's something that should be dealt with in society. However, Rachel is more the matriarch in this play, and her encounter with the planter was more than once. So in setting the play, this is my perception, this is my opinion. I don't think she was forced into anything. I think she made that conscious decision because in her having good relation with the planter, her husband is safe because they were living on a plantation that they did not own and they could have been thrown out had she not done what she did. Right. A thought just came to mind, you know, about the, the, um, the new plantations. Yeah. I think it was Derek Walker to refer to the whole hotel sector as the new plantations mm -hmm. by the sea. Um, Can I but just perhaps interject? Yes. I mean, Caribbean societies, Caribbean women, have had to eke out a living, have had to deal with issues of survival. And so Scott is pointing to the issue of uh, women having to make decisions that are sometimes contrary to their own moral standings, mm -hmm. that they're they're seeking survival, s issues of survival, issues of, of wanting to cross over into safer ground and, and so on. So the Caribbean woman has had a diverse um, range of issues to deal with, not just being mothers or mm -hmm. being wives. They have had to be um, breadwinners. They've had to stand in the shadow of men who are failing to alcoholism, to drugs, to uh, failed um, ambitions. So the the Carib Scott is showing us a very strong woman, a very a woman who is who who is clear thinking. She's making those decisions that will um, nurture the family, that will keep the family. Although they may be in contravention of um, societal um, norms and standards. So that's how I see the matriarch as as someone who takes on diverse roles depending on what the situation is that that is presented to her and um, a lot of people would condemn Rachel for mm -hmm. sleeping with the planter but that that in itself shows what uh, Dara has said that she's she's trying to ensure that her her family unit survives that is that is tantamount to everything else that that for her is is proponent to everything else thanks I noticed that um, in the scene that Rachel was very defensive of Lali Karima. Um, when Bridget um, spoke about Lali as an example of what she would not like to become, um, Rachel is very protective of Lali. Can you tell us a little about um, why this is so? What, what is it about Lali that Bridget was, you know, didn't want to be modeled after? And why is Rachel defensive of her? 
Okay, one must understand that a play is a reflection of society and Echo in the Bone offers us a reflection of our Caribbean society as he introduces women. So when he introduces Lali and Bridget and Rachel, he does not just introduce women to contrast and compare them, but to show that every woman adds something to society. So although Lali is seen as promiscuous to some people, she only seeks comfort where she gets it, which some women do. And although Bridget has a freedom of choice and she seems more liberal, right, she still has her shortcomings. So in doing that, Dennis Scott is trying to portray that all women add something to the table. It's not just one, it's not just one who you think has more moral conduct. They all add something, whether good or bad, and it makes up society as a whole. Excellent. Good. I could see that this play was really um, a play that would strike students, um, you know, because of the a lot of the issues close to home that um, it would be stimulating. Um, so I wonder, Miss Severin, what is the experience of, of, of teaching that play, you know, to a literature class of at SLCC? I think you should ask the, the students, <laughs> but but let me just preface yeah. by saying, you know, it's a very exciting play to to deal with um, because it it really grapples with the issues of remembering and forgetting as a people as a West Indian society are we are we going to forget because it's gruesome it's violent or are we going to remember and then from the members the different parts of the society are we going to build a new um, so to forget is to erase part of ourselves but to remember is is a very a process that scott invites us to do and he's saying that we cannot escape remembering because within the sinews of our bones there are echoes of the past and uh, not remembering where you came from not remembering your history is devastating to a society so scott is evoking that um, in this play and it's a very exciting play because it allows the students to see the value of slavery and uh, um, although it had all its ills that it is still a part of our, our consciousness and do we have develop amnesia or do we get up and say let us build a new society from the from the the remnants of slavery and this is what scott invites us to do so it's it it makes for a very broad dynamic discussion about our society about our past about history about remembering about forgetting about our own identity as a people as a caribbean people what do we want to be as a caribbean people do we want to be uh, remembered as people with with a violent past that we solve all our problems with a cutlass you know that sort of thing so very well expressed yeah. Yeah. we have to take a break now mm -hmm. but we will continue with that um, line when we return we'll go over to the audience welcome back to text and context um, and we looking at an echo in the bone by dennis scott and we're speaking with um, the lecturer at the south of college at lecturer in literature gloria severa and her students um, and now we're going to turn to our audience, our literature class, and we're going to ask them about the experience of studying this, please. So tell us, yes, what has been your experience of studying an echo in the bone? Can you share with us? Wow. Studying an echo in the bone, I was able to get an understanding of black history. We were able to see a revisioning of the history because most of it has been taught by the Europeans but in this play, we see the writer taking it and putting it into the black perspective, making you see the black people's identity, their life, what they went through. And in so, we understand what goes on in our societies, and we see the stereotypes being debunked. And through that, we're able to adapt and see the progress of our society as literature students. So what you have to take from the play is who we are as a people, where should we go from here, and how do we deal with the whole slave mentality and what we went through, and where are we going from this point on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
the effect um, this play had on me was the significance and emphasis on remembrance. Because in today's day and age, you find young people not very interested in their cultural history and not paying attention to or realizing the significance and the issues of slavery and how they carry down from generation to generation, affecting us and our behaviors. And at some times, we don't see that. But this play opened my eyes to that and realized how all these teachings from the past are to be carried on and not just forgotten because it is a part of our culture and we should ensure that it's always remembered. Thank you. Yes? Yes, go ahead, miss. Um, well, the effect that the play had on me was that it allowed me to better appreciate my culture and appreciate myself as a black person because growing up in St. Lucia, we tend to be stereotyped based on our skin color, based on certain features of our physical attributes. But for me, learning and remembering what my ancestors went through to get us where we are now, it made me even prouder to be a black person. Wonderful. Yes. Anyone else? All right. I? Perhaps I would like to, yes. Um, well, let's switch over to Daryl, who wants to add something to this. I just, I just like to say that while studying the play, it made it really difficult to ignore the kind of people that we are in the Caribbean. Because, I mean, despite it being a Jamaican play written by a Jamaican writer, a lot of the things that go on in the play happen right here in our society today, even some of the things. Some of the things. But like PJ said, seeing what our ancestors had to go through and what it took for them to get here and the progress that the Caribbean has made, it made me even prouder to be not just a black woman, but a big black woman. <laughs> so. Very good. Um, one interesting thing that came from the audience was the whole um, issue of memory. And also, um, in addition to that, how some of what has happened still affect us with, and we're not conscious of it. I think that was very clear um, in the play uh, because we saw how Son Son was able to um, almost relive his father's experience. Yeah? Um, so it seems very pertinent um, for us to be studying that kind of play at this moment in, when we think about um, St. Lucian history. Ironically, we don't know enough about our own history. Yeah. I'm hoping that perhaps, you know, um, when literature students study that play and realize how um, a writer like Scott makes history such an important part of his own um, writing, that we can be motivated to know more about our history so we can understand more about ourselves. Um, I'd like to ask um, Karima, could you tell me what scene or what scenes were your favorite in the play and why? Okay, my favorite scene was the last scene in which Rachel says the drums will keep beating. So in that scene, we realize that th the title of the play is An Echo in the Bone. And in its own right, you would think of an echo, something that resonates, a sound that keeps beating on and on and on. So through that scene, the last one, we can see that everything that we have learned before beats on in this life. That everything we have learned beats on. Everything we went through beats on. No matter how much you try to run away from it, the past is very much linked to the present and the future. Okay, viewers, we're in time for another break. But stay put. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Text and Context. And we are looking at the play An Echo in the Bone. And we have with us um, the lecturer in literature at the South Orleans Community College, Miss Gloria Semre, and her class. Um, I hope you did enjoy the scene and you remember it. Because um, I'm going to go over to the young lady who played the character of Bridget. Uh, that is Rochelle Emanuel. Rochelle, um, can you please share with us the experience of playing Bridget? Um, how, how did you feel through the process? You know, did it make any difference to you? Did you learn more about the character and so on? Okay. Well, my experience with playing Bridget Bridget was a character I could identify with since I'm very familiar with 
all the women empowerment and feminist movement and all of that. Um, I was raised around, you could say, 10 women. So I really know all about the challenges women face on a day-to-day -day basis. I know about the domestic issues we encounter day-to-day. -day. And I find that Bridget's character brings out what we want as women in the modern society. All right. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Um, right. And... Um, Thinking about Bridget yeah. and Rachel, um, Son Son Jaco, who are very interesting characters. But the, the style and form of the play, um, as Cot has devised it, um, allows us to, to view other characters that these main characters play to the ritual. Um, and we, we meet some very interesting characters in the play. So I'll just throw out to the audience and the panel generally. Can you share for us some of those? some of the interesting characters that we meet in the play. Perhaps your favorite character, and why? Yes, maybe we'll come back to the panel. I think for me it's a deaf mute. Uh, he's really enigmatic of what our society is. We have a lot of people in our society who do not speak, who do not hear the echoes. They are they are people who who exist without any kind of tenor from the past and they just they're totally deaf but what is interesting about this character uh, Scott gives him the drum as his voice and and so he's not a lost character we we get from him um, the the reverberations of Africa and the drum becomes the emblem of his of his expression so Yes, he may be deaf mute, but he is Africa. And for those of us who want to hear Africa, we can hear it through the drum. And mm -hmm. Scott says that very clearly. Our culture, African culture, we must listen. Yes, very well said. Good. Um, your favorite character, Dara Karimo? My favorite character would have to be the maroon, the mixed maroon particularly, because he is a mix of both black and white he's neither he's neither of them and because of that he is unable to hate black or white because he's both and they make up the blood that runs through his vein and one of this that was one of the scenes that came off as one of the characters doubled as the maroon and that character was faced with the challenge of killing a white man and he refrained from doing so because, you know. He was divided, divided to the bone. He was divided mm -hmm. to the bone, as Miss Evan just said. And that, for me, is very interesting because we do have a lot of mixed people in our society mm -hmm. who it's face these well issues. Mm -hmm. So much so that they were extricated and made into the coloreds, which, to me, they should be the people who are accepted Okay, let me stop. Like that, that yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Identity is certainly a very important issue yeah. um, in Caribbean literature, Caribbean drama, and also in Caribbean society, in the real society. Um, Caribbean people are still grappling with the issue of identity. I mean, you know, who is a Caribbean person? Who is a St. Lucia? Is a St. Lucian a black skinned person? Is a Caribbean person a black skinned person? Um, can you be white and, and be St. Lucian and Caribbean? Um, we have many people, Shabin, who are Indian, um, partly Indian, etc. Um, these are issues that Caribbean people still grapple with and which the writers, Caribbean writers and dramatists, are, st are still always exploring because it's, it's such a dynamic uh, um, um, issue. Um, it's, it's such, it still involves some serious predicaments um, that, um, that seems not to have any kind of resolution. Um, so it's, it's very, very fertile territory. Um, for art and literature, so it's it's not um, surprising that Scott, yeah. you know, even although he is focusing on the, the the black experience, still finds it necessary to explore these issues for the character um, that you are speaking of. Yeah. Um, 
I perhaps we can also think of the what happened to Rachel and what would have happened to other Caribbean women who would have given birth to mixed you know children. to yeah. children who are mixed and offspring who are, who are mixed, um, so that we have a, a society now that is is a very complex um, society. But um, other characters, um, interesting characters, um, Karima, perhaps you can tell us. Well, I don't have a favorite character, but the character I found interesting was that of Dreamboat, where his name basically describes his personality. He's a young man with a lot of potential who has nowhere to go. And I found that he was interesting to me because that depicts that of young people right now, today. We are full of potential, but with nowhere to go. So it, it begs the question, can we not go because of our own hindrances or because of society? So now we have to look at ourselves and evaluate how can we get further as young people and not become a ship of dreams that never sail. Wonderfully put, yeah. I'm thinking of crew, uh, the name crew, suggestive of the entire crew or crews of us that came to the Caribbean, you know, uh, um, a makeup Caribbean society, uh, but crew who found himself with that dilemma, who became a criminal and became lost and, and, and um, who was without his family. Um, you know, it's sad what happened to crew, um, but there, the play d does end with some hope. Um, you know, perhaps Bridget is the hope um, of the play and her child. Uh, they provide a hope for a Caribbean society, a new Caribbean society, uh, where there will be um, a way in which we, we contend with, with our, our past, we contend with our history, the tribulations of our history, but we do this in such a way that we can create a, a, a meaningful society uh, where we can all exist um, and find, um, not that we forget the past, but we are able to relate and find meaning um, with our current situation where we have dealt with the issues of the past. Uh, I, I, you know... I became... Yes. Not to cut you short. I Sorry, just be please, I just yes. became very antsy when you called crew a criminal. <laughs> uh, I just uh, yeah. I think crew is acting on behalf of the race and he takes up this burden of of the past and criminality doesn't come to mind when I think of crew. I think of crew as being heroic standing up for the entire race so i got a little uncomfortable yes you were right criminal yes. as society would see but yes, certainly not yes. in terms of not not in terms of the literary mind the literary mind would would stand not stand in judgment but would would provide some sort of balance yes um, we have to leave it here because we are out of time it's every, um, thank you very much thank you very much panel um, Dara, Sidwan, Karim, Lewis, Ms. Gloria Severe. Thank, Thank you very much, Lucha Class, for made up our audience and our technical crew. Thanks very much um, for this edition of Text and Context. I'm um, Dr. Travis Week signing out. See you next time.